what is the one thing that we're going to use with reality capture that's going to grab people? That's going to make them understand, you know, the importance of what it is that we do, right? We talk about safety. We talk about time. We don't have to go back on site. You have living legacy of what's there. All this stuff. We're just scratching the surface, though, with what we can do with reality capture. Welcome to the Reality Capture Network, where we focus on technology-driven innovation, education, and community. The Reality Capture Network, bringing the future to you. On this episode of the RCN Podcast, the Director of Digital Practice and Technology at AECOM, Michael Warren. To me, that was the start of the digital twin, because we were incorporating a lot of different types of data into one source. In business, we always think of the no's before we think of the yeses. Yeah. And how do we overcome that? How I raised my kids very young was I gave them a designated area. Here's your wall. This is where you express yourself. We're starting to see more paths cross alongside the creativity and the futuristic ideas into the workplace now than ever before. You're utilizing reality capture in a way that most aren't. If we took those kind of methodologies and got out of the box and used them in other ways, it's pretty awesome. These are a lot of new career industry things that we should be doing. I just don't think we go far enough with how we explore what we're looking at. Welcome to another episode of the Reality Capture Network podcast. Today, we're excited to have back for the second time, Michael Warren with AECOM. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. You were one of our earliest episodes when we first started the podcast. Yeah, Sam. You and Sam came on uh, back during the, the shutdown times, and uh, we're excited to have you back and dig in. I know we've had a little bit of engagement since then, and we got to have you come out to our conference. So you see you're wearing our hat. Appreciate that. Uh, excited to have you back and come talk a little deeper this, uh, this round. So I would love to start with the story of your background. We know that you have been in the industry for a while. You've obviously seen a lot of change. Could you take us back to your story of how you kind of got into the industry? Maybe what inspired your your uh, your entry into your role? Uh, it started back in college. Uh, I'm a graduate of Carnegie Mellon, and part of their nomenclature when they teach, and even now they still do this. Now they're making machine learning programming mandatory for all 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 students, but. Um, we got we got involved in 3D modeling while we were in school and creating tessellation patterns for illustration purposes for things like tile and understanding Islamic history and other things and how they were able to do all these wonderful artifacts, right, with math and geometry and, and understanding things. That's when I was exposed to it, and that was... 35 years ago. Um, and it opened my mind. Uh, I started doing it by hand. Um, pen bar and things like that. You guys are probably too young yep, to, I to can't know. Say what I did that. Nope. <laughs> but drafting, drafting on a board and, and trying to do the math and the calculations on a board at scale you know, to translate that information and to do projections. So if you had things that curved, you had to draw an ax on a metric to tell the story to get it across to the contractors who were going to build. So I started to adapt to that, but then through the programming classes I had, I realized there was going to be a lot easier way to do this. And... Uh, at the time, we had just switched from Apple to Next computers. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, the short generation of the Next computer. But CMU was the first and largest purchaser of the Next machines, which did have incredible capabilities. So I was able on there to program taking two-dimensional tessellations into 3D models. Um, mostly by understanding X, Y, Z inputs, right? 
And you guys should understand that because that's what comes out of a scam. Yeah. So it was the early days of putting that information in and understanding how to plot it, to read it, to get your three-dimensional representation to show up the way you want it. From there, I didn't feel I learned enough in school about the industry, so I moved into building inspection and code enforcement um, and did that as chief inspector, tons of certifications. I was the local fire marshal. I was the local uh, emergency management coordinator. Did a lot of things. It was a great learning experience, but through that, I was able to bring GIS in to connect it to our, um, I'm not going to drop the names of the systems, but the systems that our police used when they got calls. So they could more rapidly identify where a call was coming from, develop the best path and route to get there, um, and have an understanding of the actual physical location of, of where the call was coming from. Uh, so I had a leader that was police chief, also a CMU graduate. So we kind of got on board and tied these two systems together for geospatial reference. Uh, so they knew what was going on. And then if we had information like blueprints or photographs or other things of the house, they could also pull those up. Uh, for threat assessments and other things. So to me, that was the start of the digital twin. Mm, yeah. Because we were incorporating a lot of different types of data in, into one source, right? That called on each other. And that was all programmed in Unix. Um, then we moved on since then. So then I left there and I went into manufacturing, um, where I did that for several years, where I was a product engineer and then field service supervisor for all the products that we built. Um, and this is all division eight items, um, glass and glazing, curtain wall. Uh, what was interesting to me was backdoor in the eighties, buildings were all being built out of glass. Um, that was a huge focus. So I wanted to know and understand more about that. In doing that, I worked with them and helped them develop 3D visualization to take the orders and turn them into 3D models to go to the manufacturing floor so we could automate punching and dyeing processes for the extrusions. Because uh, we had a lot of complicated windows. I worked on the crown. If you guys have been to the Statue of Liberty. Yep. I worked on the window replacement for the crown wow. on the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> That's crazy. That's awesome. And that was done with a mix of old school and some modeling. That's very cool. But it was all handcrafted. So, um, you know, it, 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 it came into play. So I... so. In that environment, I got a Six Sigma black belt in manufacturing. And then from there, I went and did some construction for major construction workers to understand sequencing and time and the other aspects of what we had to deliver. And then it wasn't until I turned 30 that I started my architectural career. So I was one of the, at the time, one of the oldest interns ever for the AIA mm. because of the path that I chose. <clears throat> but I can tell you that unique and dynamic path when I started my career was very beneficial because I wasn't doing traditional things that an intern did. I was allowed the right specs. I was allowed to do construction administration. I was allowed to go to meetings and negotiate with clients because I had a background, even though technically I was an intern and still had to complete the process. Through that process, I delivered a few jobs, uh, got a Six Sigma black belt in design uh, for lean process management, things like that. And that was really my first foray <clears throat> into what I'll call the, the start of the, a, a, a true digital twin the way we see it now. 
taking AutoCAD and MicroStation and building 3D models out of the tools that were rich with metadata and programming them to do the same. So if you guys don't remember or never got exposed to it, MicroStation J had a great function where you could put on the old-fashioned blue and red uh, 3D goggles and bring a 3D image up on the screen and it showed up in stereo. <laughs> no, man, never never had the chance to see that either. <laughs> I still, I actually still had that software operating on a computer that I had. Wow. And it's very cool when you think about VR now compared to what was VR then. Yeah, I'd say... Uh... I'd say over the last, like you said, 35 years, you have definitely got to see a lot change as far as the technology available and the enhanced versions of maybe ways things used to be done. Um, like you're saying, you know, back then, it still was kind of that start, uh, maybe not 35 years, but at whatever time frame it was, you were working on linking GIS and information. It kind of is the beginning of the idea of digital twins. And maybe it's not what it is today with 3D and immersive, or but it is the idea of linking geospatial information with data that can be used for different applications. And you've, get, you've gotten to see a lot of that journey change as the technology has changed over the years. It's been fascinating how it's developed, but it's amazing how much data actually gets captured. Um, what has boggled my mind is what a scanner can capture. Most of us in the industry don't pay attention to what it can actually grab, what it's actually getting during that time of flight. It's pretty phenomenal. When you look at 10,000 data nodes, but you're only concerned about five. Yeah. Right. What can we do with all those other nodes that are being ignored? So I started looking into that and I've been working on a side project with a friend um, who's in the lighting industry uh, to use LIDAR to capture better photogrammic points through LIDAR capture from light because it actually picks up all those points. So there's a better understanding for fall off and IES ratios and other things because it's capturing light, right? And that can all be spectrographed in a room. So right now we do that and we just take the object, right? And, and we put some kind of lumen intensity on it and we place it in the space. And then we tell it to go render. What if we actually had LIDAR laid on top of that that is the actual light. Mm. And we started to take that into account when we're talking about uh, mesh models and, and, and virtual realization and other things that we're doing. Instead of having it simulated with a light source from the upper right or upper left, or you know, if you're outside picking uh, the azimuth at a certain time of the year, you actually have the real information. So you're getting real capture of what's going on, and you can study that over time. The value to that, to me, is for things like historic preservation, where you have material degradation that occurs on facades because of solar exposure that weren't thought about when they selected the materials. Yeah. So that's why I said, that's why it was like through the looking glass. I've been, I've been down this road in a lot of different ways, and for me... Every time I see somebody post something or I read something, and I joke with Phil about this, my attitude is curiouser and curiouser. <laughs> Just like Alice. You know what I mean? Every time something was experienced, there was a curiosity about it and in, in terms of what was going on. And I even have personas uh, based on different roles that people do inside of companies. I'm going to be doing a presentation next week to CIOs and CISOs based on this concept, you know, through the looking glass, but each character through the looking glass has a persona that actually ties back to business. And I'm focusing on based on that character, 
how that persona plays itself out in the day-to-day world. The project manager, the project controls advisor, the financial advisor, the client account manager, your direct report manager that supervises your day-to-day work. Everybody has a role and they're all different. But if we look at it in the standpoint of where we're going, we need to talk more about that on reality capture and start to define those roles. We need to really start defining a reality capture director, a reality capture manager, a field service manager, a field service tech, right? A post-processing manager, post-processing technician. These are a lot of new career industry things that we should be doing. Yeah. It's a group in my mind. Yeah. Because this technology is here and that's why I love RCN and that's why I'm trying to promote it is to have that dialogue where we start to create those titles in our companies and we have an understanding of how we present those metrics as far as what it is we're trying to do. Yeah. No, I I think that's a big need in the industry and we've been talking about it quite a bit and you know, it's a I think it's a quite a process to create something new like that in an industry is starting to define roles and define knowledge base and qualify the knowledge that somebody has in a certain area and maybe the just like other industries have, right? You create a certification process of, you know, what is an entry level laser scanning technician have to know? Is there a level one or two or three? How do you qualify what position you're trying to hire for and the experience someone has? Or, and part of the reason I've I've thought the the need for that exists is, you know, we still hear a lot in the industry of a random company goes out and buys a random tool that they don't understand very well and they run out and do a job improperly and without the right workflows and the data's bad and well, if the owner doesn't know that technology enough, how can we as an industry start to define a certain level of understanding or qualification or knowledge base in order for the right person to be picked with the right tool for the right job? Um, I think that that process should begin and it, it goes down to individual roles and knowledge base and into you know qualifying companies even on what types of work they you know can accomplish. I also, uh, I have a question on that. You have been in this role and you've been in the industry and paying attention from that perspective for quite some time now. So have you noticed any correlations with different identities or personalities or archetypes within those individual roles you just mentioned? Yeah. You want to know what they are? Yeah. I have nine of them. Let's hear it. And, and it's basically filled based off of the white rabbit, <laughs> which we laugh about, right? But what was his, what was his mantra throughout the entire book? I'm late. I'm late. I'm late. And as we all know, Matthew, as you know, running your company, they don't give us enough time to do what they expect, right? So they want it yesterday. We're always late. So when we start, we're late. How can we be innovative and bring those things forward? So I have nine basic rules that I look at as far as KPIs, okay? And these lead to the ROI of not just a person, but basically the task, right? So time spent on important tasks versus time spent on low priority tasks. A lot of times people don't know how to task manage, but they get freaked out. And then if they know they have a delivery deadline and they feel that there's too much of a burden, that creates a physical, a mental, and a health risk for the person doing the task. Because now they have anxiety. Now they have stress. Now they're feeling pressure. Are they doing their best job, right? But what is it? We never sit back and ask, what is it are you stressing about? And it could be a low priority for that particular job. But for that person, we never ask that question. What's what's the key to what you're doing, right? How many scans do I have to produce in a day? 
Can I do it? Did I break it up in my business plan in reasonable chunks that can be done for the scan tech that I have? We focus on the knowledge, the skill sets, the basis of our scan technicians. So we're not going to overburden someone and say, you have to do 400 scans in a day when that's not part of their wheel set because they just started scanning six months ago. It's not possible. Even with a VLX, they're going to miss things. They're not going to close the loop. We're not going to get good data, right? They're not going to be mindful of what they're doing. They're just walking around and then they sort of lose track of what's going on. I've seen it happen with other companies. They lose track of what's going on. They're carrying this device and they just walk with it. But the other thing is the percentage of the tasks that are completed in an allotted time. That has to be factored in from a business standpoint. Um, the number of tasks that are completed in a day, a week, and a month. So you can start to establish metrics and benchmarks. Um, a hospital scan is totally different than an airport scan. That's totally different than a highway scan. But when you go into modeling all of those things, they're completely different in terms of your approach with how you model them and how long it's going to take to model. And I'd be hard-pressed to find out if anybody in the industry is willing to share modeling time versus scan time. Mm. Uh, because I know we have a metric for that. I'm not going to share it, but we have a metric for that. We, we know how long it takes to model based off the nature and type of project we have to model but that's also based off of LOD. Yeah. So an LOD 200 is going to take X number of hours, whereas 300 or 350 for a highway project is, is a completely different beast. Yeah. The overall productivity for output of revenue generated within that time frame. We're in the business to make money. Did we lose money during the pursuit or how much money did we make during the pursuit? And did we analyze and look at why we made that kind of profit? Was it more efficient processes? Um, did we have very, very, very strong skill sets on the team for delivery that understood how to do things more efficiently and better? Taking tips and tricks like Revit, doing things like generating parking lot lighting using a railing family and nesting in the lighting family for the luminaire in the parking lot and giving it a baluster spacing that goes along the curve. That's a trick. We're not violating anything. It's helping us get the model done. The elements are still there. It still renders correctly. It can still be scheduled correctly and it documents itself the proper way. You're just taking advantage of a tool that you wouldn't think has a common name or a common place because we think of a railing as being a guardrail or something on a stair. Well, if we took those kind of methodologies and got out of the box and used them in other ways, it's pretty awesome because you can measure to a point cloud and we've done that and laid out paths and did what I'm talking about. And instead of matching the point cloud exactly nuance by nuance, going through every little detail, we were able to lay it out very quickly and go back in and adjust the elements based on where they were in the point cloud. Um, time spent on professional skills and training. I don't think in the reality capture world, there's enough time spent there. There are people that do it and learn it as a passion, stay on top of it, and they get very active in it. And a lot of the ones that I've seen in the AEC industry have left the industry and gone to work for software companies. So we're losing talent there. Um, time spent on delegation and collaboration with team members, huge. That talks about what I talked about in the beginning. And then time spent on strategic planning and goal setting. 
where 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 are we going with this? Is it just pretty pictures? I was just part of a team's call in the company and I changed uh, my pill image to my avatar. And it was brought up during the call that I'd switched over to my avatar. And I was like, this was a call about digital. And I was like, we should be having these calls in the future in the metaverse where we're all walking around our own little virtual environment with our avatars and we're engaging with each other when we talk. When it's our time to talk, go get on the podium and you stand up there and you're speaking to your audience. And when people raise their hands, they, you know, you know, I got something to say and it records and does everything it's supposed to do. It's not out of the realm of possibility. Wouldn't those be fun meetings? Yeah, I I think there's going to be a huge amount of that in the future. And, you know, a lot of people, when you see things like metaverse get talked about in the public and, you know, the hype happens quickly where everybody's talking about it and, you know, they expect that something's going to happen in six months and we're all going to be living virtual or, you know, and then it doesn't happen. And so people think now it's not a thing. The hype happens because the technology is moving that way. A lot of people just don't see it or they lose interest or, but I think we're going to see as the technology continues to develop and enhance and, you know, AR, VR becomes more lightweight and more cost effective and people are moving to remote work options and we're going to see a very normal aspect of that being a part of a day-to-day life in getting in meetings and, and, you know, even to the point of the future of like holograms in your room, instead of only a virtual cartoon, I, you know, cartoon looking, uh, figure in a, in a virtual world. Um, I think we're going to see real integration between the physical and the digital in many ways. What do you guys think about taking movie industry techniques into what we do for the AEC world? I think we're missing out on some great opportunities. Um, These training videos that get done, for example, um, where we're scanning and recreating mesh and this environment, and you put the avatar in there with the headset, and then they're interacting with what's going on. Uh, Why aren't we using suits? Because that's what they do for LiDAR for all the animation that I had and all the movies that we love to watch, right? That's CGI. Mm -hmm. Why not put that operator in that actual environment, scan it, but also scan the operator Mm -hmm. and cap for that and run that real time. I just had a discussion with Adobe about that, and we're going to be further exploring that concept of bringing CGI into the AEC world. So I don't know how... Bill, maybe you mess around with After Effects or other, you know, Adobe products, but yeah, well, this brings up a good point because you were, you were just talking a few moments ago about utilizing reality capture in a way that most aren't. You're seeing things and tools being used in a different way because you're training and you're you're bringing your curiosity and you're bringing a different perspective to your genuine passion for what you're doing. And I think that goes right in that same discussion of how can we look at these things and improve upon them with other industries that have already been established and already do things in one way and look at it as a strength and, and start seeking out people that have experience in different backgrounds and getting them to collaborate. They may not be able to um, jump into a field and be you, you know, in reality capture, but they definitely have a voice and have something to add to that discussion that will get you thinking that might inspire you to create a completely different tool than you ever thought about. I've been down that path and I've had great people that I've mentored that brought incredible things to me that enlightened me and opened my eyes. But I didn't just take that information and basically steal it and use it from, I brought them with me. Mm -hmm. There was true mentorship there to grow their understanding, right? AI and machine learning 
I have people that used to work for me, work for other companies now. I still mentor them. But they're bringing scripts or ideas for scripting to me all the time. And the first question I ask them is, what's going to be the ROI behind doing this? We're all in this to make money. What's going to be the benefit? How long is it going to take you, but how much time is it going to reduce off the back end for your colleagues? How much better is it going to make it? Is this is this a one a one off use or can it be replicated across everything that you do? Mm -hmm. Right. So it goes back to, again, when I think of this and your question, Phil, it, it leads me to the Cheshire cat. When he told Alice, imagination is the only weapon in the war with reality. Oh, I love that. Right? And I, I just don't know where we are in inspiring people to imagine anymore. Mm -hmm. We stop our kids from drawing on walls because yeah. it's destructive. Right? It's destructive to the house. What I learned and how I raised my kids very young was I gave them a designated area Here's your wall. This is where you express yourself. And they did. It wasn't all over the house. It was in that area. And I said, I'm going to come and mom's going to come. And we're going to have what we call critiques when you demonstrate what it is you did on the wall. Or if we see something, you're going to have to present it to us to explain what was on your mind when you put all this up there, right? Their minds were developed to not understand no is the first response. And I think in business, we always think of the no's before we think of the yeses. Yeah. And how do we overcome that? Right? And I, I, I think that's a great thing that you bring up, Matt, a lot in your post. How do we overcome that pedagogy that we've learned? How do we change that? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. And I think it's a difficult one um, because a lot of companies are focused on structure and their plan and they put people in roles and, and they often don't have a very open culture of communication where they can foster conversations uh, and be creative and you know, so many companies have that that limitation, I think. And and I think a lot of people are starting to learn that uh, in, in culture today and in companies. I think we're starting to see more of uh, an open idea, um, at least certain business types. And I think that's one of the best things we can do is create an open culture for conversation because when you allow somebody brand new to walk in and be able to say, hey, I don't understand why you're doing this this way. Or what if we change, you know, have you ever thought about using this new technology in this way? When you allow everybody in the company or everybody in different roles to be expressive and share ideas and share creativity, uh, no matter how experienced or inexperienced they are, you're going to get different perspectives and different backgrounds and different ideas that may completely change, you know, you, how we do things. Um, so one, I think is just making that a bit normal of like you're saying with you and your kids is don't make it an automatic. No, don't make it a shutdown of you're not allowed to draw on the walls ever. Like, well, let's, let's talk about when can we draw on a wall? Where could we draw on a wall? What could we draw on a wall with and, and set up that structure so that there's a way to do it appropriately because at the same time, a business can't be completely free, uh, you know, uh, hey, everybody do whatever you want, you know, then we have complete chaos. It's not organized. It's not structured in a way that's helpful. If we can create organized, uh, you know, chaos, organized chaos or creativity, uh, if there's a way to organize it properly, then I think we're going to see massive benefit out of allowing that creativity. And this brings up something in my mind as well, is that the example that comes to mind, even within a industry that is thought of as completely creative animation at Pixar, they're the structure of their actual building and room for board meetings was the same that had been in every boardroom or me meeting room in any kind of business. And one day, John Lasseter, Ed Catmull decided, 
this is completely messed up because we have extremely creative people in this room that we know have really good ideas that are not sharing because we have this visual hierarchy. So the solution to that was they got rid of titles. They had like titles out in front of them. They got rid of titles. They put the room, it was circular. So everyone would like talk around this round table and the discussion opened up and there were people that were bringing things up because they were like, I don't know what that person's role. I'm not intimidated anymore. So that open line of creativity started opening up and they were hearing stuff that they had never heard before. And it was very um, inspiring. But the other thought that comes to mind is that quote from the matrix where Morpheus says, there are rules here. Some can be bent, some can be broken. So you in effect had created, there are rules here, but here's where we bend it. And your children were allowed to express themselves. And that already at that age was a seed for how they're going to operate in this world. And I think in reality capture, especially it's, it's a, it's a challenge because you have a lot of people that are very intelligent and very internal. And if you have an environment that is traditional, a lot of their creative firepower is never going to get heard in that traditional structure. So we do, I mean, I think it is a good conversation to have. Like, how do you open that up in a company, in any company, especially like this, where it's like creativity is 100% needed, but the challenge is there. Do you guys ever take uh, the text information associated with point cloud and put it in Excel? Nope. I want you to try it. Let me know what you see. <laughs> You'd be amazed. I bet. Something that simple because it has X, Y, Z and other information it can replicate. Uh, you know, a, a workbook based program can rep replicate a 3D model. I was doing that for paradigm shifting 20 years ago, putting X, Y, Z coordinates into Excel and generating a dynamic three-dimensional model out of what was going on. Um, I just don't think we go far enough with how we explore what we're looking at, right? There's, there's roadblocks lack of leadership support, resistance to change, legacy systems, skill gaps, data security concerns. I'm going to be speaking about all those. Those are the, the top five reasons I get why people don't want to transform mm. and don't want to make the change. Yeah. One of the things that I bring up was... Yeah, I don't know how old you guys were when you got your first mobile phone, but you know, I had this, which is like a pocket computer now. We all have one, um, various sizes, but the original one was a flip phone. Yep. And it was a StarTech for Motorola. And it was the premier phone. But you know what inspired that phone? The communicator off of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. So when we watch these shows, are we really inventing something new or are we taking other people's ideas or thoughts and turning them into reality? What did they do with the most recent Star Wars? They got rid of the lightsaber and they had basically the wand that had a continuous plasma stream between two points but could also go against the lightsaber. That's more realistic than a lightsaber. Because there's no end to where the plasma goes on a lightsaber. How do you stop it? Right? Magic. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you were going to say, Matt. I, you know, I was just going to say, I, I think it's both. You know, a, somebody who creates a movie or an idea, somebody came up with the idea. Someone in, it, it was creative enough to think of starting that in the first place, whether it be the movie first or in reality first. And often it is. We see things in movies or in books or in novels or, or something 
that we look at now and we're like, hey, that's how things are now, but that book was written 30 years ago. Um, and that shows that people do have the forward thinking, they have the creativity, and now we're trying to be in that place, I think, in the work uh, aspect where we bring in some of that creativity. We, we are talking about digital twins and metaverse and this idea of the future and autonomous driving and robotics, you know, in stores. And, and I think we're starting to see more paths cross alongside the creativity and the futuristic ideas into the workplace now than ever before. Um, though I think we still have more of those, you know, barriers to break through. Um, but I was recently giving a talk about innovation and, you know, I, that, I bring up that point of, we could sit here and talk about these fun futuristic ideas, but guess what? They don't happen if creative people don't actually start taking action to implement them. Nothing is built without somebody building it. Somebody has to do it. So we, as a community that have these conversations that believe that we can build something, we are the ones that can actually do it. But so many people worry about intellectual property, right? So they're not willing to share. Yep. That's the problem that I found with collaboration. Well, whose IP is this really? Is it yours or is it mine? And if it turns into something, who's going to profit from yeah. it? Who's going to profit from it the most instead of let's solve a problem and create something fantastic, right? So I talked to Phil about this, and Phil, you never gave me an answer, but I'm going to put you on the spot right oh, now. Geez. Here we go. I, I want to know to you, and then Matt, I got the same question for you. Give me your top five best science fiction writers of all time. Oh, geez. <laughs> um... Jules Verne, Arthur C. Clarke, Philip K. Dick, um, uh, Orson Scott Card. Okay. You got one more. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Frank? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's just lie and think about it. What about you? See, I'll tell you when there's an area that I really excel in, uh, and maybe that's reality capture. When it comes to books, writers, movies, directors, actors, I, I really couldn't tell you, to be, on, really? to be honest. No, it's cool. That's good. That's good. I mean, that, that's admirable, and it's great. I just The reason I ask that question is because a lot of that spurned my interest for ideas. Yeah. Especially whenever I look at the age of when some of these books were written. These guys were thinking about things that are happening now. Well, one, was there a pushback in culture to not make them happen when when the books were written? Two, was there not the technology to make them happen when the books were written? Because a lot of this stuff could have inspired people to do very great things, and we we could have other types of weapons and other types of machinery and interaction with robots and other things a lot sooner than what we have what was the impetus why that never happened as far as inspiration so phil i was holding my fingers up because you covered three for me where we cross over but i would also add that isaac asimov oh yeah hg <sighs> wells yeah jules verne robert heinlein oh yeah dang yeah you know, those are standouts to me in the sense of what what really makes all of this stimulate and and work, you know? And I think, Matt, if, if we had a lot more focus on some of those anecdotes or some of those stories, we talked about it a little bit on the Metaverse panel, right? We were talking about what we envisioned as panelists, what the Metaverse was going to be. What if more of us in our industry got engrossed in science fiction? Imagine then what we could do. Yeah, yeah. And and honestly, um, you know, 
some of this is what I want to do with RCN. You know, I see I see RCN as becoming a platform where people are wanting to have conversation and wanting to learn and listen listen to others. And I think it empowers us to say, we can share different stories. We can share different ideas. We can decide to hold a panel to talk about science fiction. We can talk about the metaverse. We can talk about having these ideas and brainstorming sessions. And I believe that because a lot of companies might be hesitant to ideas and creativity and change and all of these other things that are difficult, I feel like as a standalone community, RCN can be the outlet for that, that people can come together to share these ideas, to build something that is unique yet that people can use together and give suggestion to each other. We can bring in people from outside of industry to inspire. And that's, you know, I don't, I haven't really been deep into science fiction. And obviously we've talked about some of the movies and some of the stories, and I've watched a lot of those, but, um, you know, that's where a lot of my inspiration has come from, even in building RCN is it's not come from just doing my work in my company. It's come from looking at how other people are using platforms and using different technologies and building communities. And so I absolutely believe that by bringing in multiple people from different backgrounds and different industries, we can transform how we think about things. So I I love the idea, and it's definitely what I want to continue trying to do. I think you know one of the things that you you made me think of, Matthew, when you, when you were speaking was um, DC Comics and the Superman series, the various different ones that came out. But one, whenever I was a child, uh, the Kryptonians had what they called a change engine that would convert a planet to become similar to Krypton so they could survive. Um, I think of that about our industry. What What is our change engine? What is the one thing that we're going to use with reality capture that's going to grab people? That's going to make them understand, you know, the importance of what it is that we do, right? We talk about safety, we talk about time. We don't have to go back on site. You have living legacy of what's there. All this stuff. We're just scratching the surface, though, with what we can do with reality capture. And we're not pushing it to an envelope where it needs to be. I mean, I, I really want, and I want you guys' opinion on this because I know it's controversial for me on LinkedIn. I'll use a mesh for the appropriate time and place. And that's mostly to represent something to clash against. Okay, so I get geometry that I can clash against. But I can't classify that mesh. So the mesh is just a file bloat to me. It has no meaning. Because I can't classify it for asset management. What am I going to do with it? Right, I can't pass that off in the eight dimensions of information modeling. I just have a model for viz, and that's all it's good for, as far as I'm concerned. And I haven't had anybody make a compelling argument to the contrary. They're just, no, meshes are great. You should use them. You shouldn't have to build stuff natively, and you know, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, well, then you're not dealing in the asset management world. Yeah. If that's your perspective, right? So what are you guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I see a lot of the same conversations. Obviously, meshing has come a long way and the visual aspect is amazing. Um, and in fact, I'd first pose a question to you. If you could break apart a mesh to a certain extent and classify some of the elements within it, would you then think that the mesh would be more usable or do you still see enough use in actually having a full built model that the majority of your thought would still be going full model for the future? One of the things I had posted was with the exception of um, point views, which I use all the time Yep, because I can break the model apart and I can classify the mesh. I can generate IFC. I get the metadata out of it that I need. I haven't seen anything else that does that. The one other that I, I know they're working on and I saw some with doing the webinar with them is Preview 3D. Yes, Nicholas working yep. on it. 
So do you think that a classified mesh would be a, a next level or, and, and this is where I still explore in conversation with people too, is there's obviously still use cases for full built, you know, BIM models that have information and that have certain family types that can be used in certain ways that need to be used in design. And then there's certain uses that maybe the mesh would be enough or a classified mesh would be enough. But I feel like there are still reasons for all of them. And I don't I don't think either is going to completely go away and you won't have to model anymore. Um, I still think that for a high level digital twin of uh, a building or a facility, I still think needs to go to a full model. Ideally, but it is time. It, it takes time and it takes cost. And but that's where I still lean a lot of the time. It takes cost, it takes time, it takes money. But I think there's an application, like I said, if you were taking preview 3D and you were able to export that information with the metadata, it's still geospatially referenced, put it in your model, it's great. You know, Point Fuse does that. You get it, lines out, does what it's supposed to do, right? It's classified, you can add parameters to it because it sees it as an object. Uh, you decide how big you want the actual extraction to be, things like that. Um, you know, but a lot of what I see going on with meshing is all this. Yeah. And that that's great. That's great. But what is that doing for asset management other than using it for historic replication? Right? Look at, look at Notre Dame. It burned. Where did they go to get the information to restore the building? A freaking video game. Yeah. Because they scanned the church for the video game. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that was, and that came within a couple days because they didn't know what to do. That, that solution came within a couple days. And now we have real-time scanning, and I've talked to friends that work in the industry they're doing real-time flyovers and street passes for things like uh, uh, Gran Turismo, you know, the next phase of that. And the next, um, just there, there's a lot of games out there that are taking reality captured to the next level. And I just don't see our industry doing that. Yeah. Right. Not going to where we need to go. It's capture it, build a model, turn into drawings, turn it over. Yep. Yeah. It's accurate, and we're going to swear by that accuracy. Yeah. You know, you might not like it, designer, that those columns all don't go in a straight line, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I agree, and I think we are... I feel like we're just at the point that there are individuals and companies and even end owners who have seen the technology long enough, they've started to realize that's what's happening is the data is being used for a small project and thrown away. There's a waste of data. It's not being used to its capacity. And there are definitely conversations and interest in taking it to that next level. Like we had at our conference last year and is coming back to share this year is like ExxonMobil. You know, an organization that knows historically people have come out from all different er areas, different companies, different scanners. They scan for a single project. Data gets thrown away. And an organization that now sees the, the better way of working with visual data, with having a built environment, with being able to log in and access your digital twin of your facility at any time. And it's a difficult process because now you know, a company like that with facilities everywhere, you have to start having the, like we talked about earlier with a certification or a guardrail or a guideline of how do we go about even accomplishing something of that volume with all of our assets and how do we make it consistent with who's going to capture or how they're going to capture or what type of data we use and what platform we're going to host it in. And so even when today we decide we want to take it to that next level, those type of organizations are now looking to us as a community to say, we need help accomplishing this. Like we, we see the vision, we want to take it there, but we need your help. We need your creativity. We need you guys to help guide how to get there, which is why I'm excited about building a community that can have these conversations and we can start being proactive because that is the same interest that organizations around the world are going to have. And somebody needs to help guide how we get there and we need creativity mixed in here with all these brilliant minds in the community. 
Have you guys put on a VR headset and walked through a point cloud yet? Yes. Describe that experience. Uh, when I did it, it was a little while ago, and it was very rough. The visual was pretty bad. Um, the points were, you know, very big, and it was it was messy when I when I last tried that. Um, and that was using the point cloud directly, as opposed to trying to do like a mesh walkthrough or you know model rendering or anything like that. So very limited. We we'll have to compare notes. We've had some very good success with VR and the actual points themselves. Uh, the reality that that's that's there. So it's it's a matter of the horsepower and what you got running in the background. Um, pretty fascinating stuff. The reason I just bring it up is because if we talk about biz, like I said, I go to airports, I go to buildings, I drive down highways, go over bridges, go through tunnels. It's the matrix to me. Yeah, I literally go go through or experience those things in my life and they're not real you know because to me i just visualize everything that i just went through inside of a virtual environment and i think that's going to be that that change that that change that's going to happen right it, it's going to become more of that and maybe it could be mesh you know, if we're talking about the metaverse and, and, and Nicholas has the ability to manipulate objects inside of there with the mesh, why can't I recreate my own universe? Yeah. Think of something as small as your house. You want to move objects around, scan your house, put it in your pre 3D, move the shed over there. Hey, wife, do you think that looks cool? It's going to give you a shadow. You see what it looks like in the sun. Rotate it, reorient it, move it, you know, do what you want. But put that on the next stratosphere, right? Yep. I truly believe that in the future, you know, obviously we can't put a timeline to something like that, but I believe one day we will have that capability of every building and facility on the surface of the earth. But if I was an owner... What I think about right now is if I'm going to replicate a building or I have modules of buildings that I want to build, I'm going to build a prototype. I'm going to scan it. From there, I'm going to provide scans to my contractor to replicate it. I'm not going to pay somebody to do drawings for me. Yeah. Because like you said, you have the ability to have holograms and other things. And like I said, if we use gaming and 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 movie industry technology we have the ability to do all that now yeah i i even think at that point is where we're gonna in the next couple of years even have ai integrated in so that initial concepts of designs in the future will not take a massive upfront amount of work it will be you have a 3D map from either scanning or drone of the of the area you're going to build and you're going to run through with an AI generator similar to chat GPT integrated into something like mid journey or where you're going to put in the parameters you're going to want. And it's going to show you conceptually, here are a couple options of what this would look like. And then that will be able to convert into a design that then a professional company will take and, you know, do the maybe tweaking of, uh, to get into construction level, uh, I think there's so many ways on the visualization and the, the way the integration of AI will happen in the next few years with what's going on now. I think so much is going to change in the way we go about projects like that. My mind opens up to the idea of you would have a program like a game that people would go into and they'd be able to have the building block elements and move things around and it would stay it would have like parameters or boundaries that would keep it within code. You can't do this, but you can do it here. You can move these elements. And on top of that, it would be cool to have a, you know, have AI kind of assess you as your own like personality and likes, dislikes, what would be the happiest environment for Michael? What is going, what is the visual environment and design that is going to be more conducive to a happier version of you 
then it lays out those elements and then you get to play around. You're like, oh, I like this. I and mean, this is really calling to me. And it's staying within a, a certain code. And then it's like, all right, print. Now you have your plan. You hand that over to whatever, you know, program or, or actual physical architect that would build it at that point. And then you would feel confident knowing. Where does the stimuli come from, though, when you get to that? Because... I can think of two things. You can ask a questionnaire mm -hmm. and then I could lie on the questionnaire and not be familiar with the question. You could have an interview, do the same thing, put that into an AI um, that would machine learn from those entries or other people's entries and do a large language model out of your client base. Or would you go all the way to the scientific approach where you're probed with stimuli that are recording what's going on inside your brain? Well, my reference point is strictly from a design perspective because usually if I have like a client, I will vet them, vet their subconscious by saying, all right, as quickly as you possibly can, I'm gonna throw different ideas at you, images, and you are picking as quickly as you possibly can. Now from those images, which ones do you like best? Why? And that's where yeah, I'm exactly. Going. You can be you. That can be recorded. They can do that psychologically and neuro. You know, from a neurological standpoint, right now, what pleases you and where does that fire inside your yeah. brain? Because you might look at it and, eh, but you actually like right. it. You know what yeah. I mean? But there's something about the presentation of the image that's making you say no. But the endorphins and the other triggers are saying, yes, that's that's what and I want. And that's the key. Like that to me is bypassing the conscious mind because the conscious mind will start editing and that's not what you want. And it kind of opens up and back to the discussion of this no that is embedded in us and we have to fight against, you know, there's very few Peter Pans that are out there that, that exist because we get bombarded with no, no, no. So you have to be extremely adamant about saying yes in your mind every single time you're hearing it because that's the outside messaging. But if you can bypass that and if you can connect with your subconscious, it's usually a different story. And you're like, whoa, I didn't realize that's the way I should go. That's where true happiness is versus what's being messaged at us constantly. You know, those are two different stories. Yeah. And I think reality capture is going to be a big part of that. I think it's more than just the physical environment. I think there's there's going to be more to come. Yep. And, you know, I love having these discussions and, you know, let's wait till these kind of things get a little bit more enhanced and a little bit more intelligent, right? And we can do a lot more with them. And uh, these go back to getting smaller but more powerful. Yeah. Right, I mean, we we have them in watch form right now, so you know they can they can get a little bit smaller than that, I think, and uh, virtual displays and other things pop it up in front of us uh, that we can interface with. Um, you know, I don't know. I think the sky's going to be the limit, but I just think with the opportunities that we have out there, we should actually we're in at a place of exploration, and I'm not looking through it with glasses of saying no. I'm looking at it with glasses of wonder that anything is possible, let's give it a try. Yeah, that is, uh, that is what has excited me about this industry and why I am where I am. Because when I first got started in scanning, you know, I was working at a survey firm, we were using it for oil and gas facilities. And that's all I knew at the time, you know, that was the initial use case. It wasn't until we started, you know, talking with other industries that we weren't familiar with yet. And we started exploring and we were interested in trying to solve new problems that we weren't familiar with yet. And we started getting pulled into buildings and we got we got pulled into forensics and we started and we went down and did a ship and we went and did a gold mine and we started getting pulled into areas we had never worked in. And that's what started showing me there is a lot of application for even something like just laser scanning. And laser scanning is just one little piece of this. You know, there's so much more with all the other technologies surrounding us, but just seeing the diversity and applications for laser scanning is what started showing me the need and the opportunity and the possibility 
of all the different problems that we could solve through a, through the built environment. Uh, and it's exciting. It's exciting to be at what feels like still the ground level. The technology's come a long way. Some of us have been doing it a long time, but it feels like we're still at ground level of mass adoption. We're not, we're, we're just ramping into the point that this is becoming a need and a request and a demand by certain industries and, and companies. And it changes, it's dynamic all the time. And that's what I was talking about, about that scalability. Um, you know, I, I think uh, I'm going to paraphrase this best I can and, and Phil, correct me if I get it wrong. Discussion between the Caterpillar and Alice and uh, Caterpillar looked at her and uh, asked, who are you? And uh, Alice replied, I hardly know at the present. Um, I know who I was I got up when I got up this morning, I think. I must have changed several times since then. Right. And every day I wake up and that's that's the course of my day. I have to wear this hat in the morning and then this hat in mid morning and this hat at afternoon, this hat after that. And I'm always changing dynamics. We've been on this call. I have two hard drives that have just been sitting here crunching away. Two externals crunching away, just processing stuff simultaneously you know, and I'm blessed that I have a workstation that can allow me to video chat with you guys and do that at the same time. But, you know, whenever you sit down and you look at the amount of information that we capture and the data that we get, I think of all the things that we could be doing with it that we're not talking about instead of arguing about the best way to capture or what is the best device. What are all the potential uses of what we can do with what's there? I, I, I just think we're scratching the surface. Look at the automotive industry. They're using it for quality control checks on what they're producing. But it's rapid. That stuff's flying through. It's not sitting there and they're scanning it and saying, okay, it matches. It's flying through. And it's processing in the background, does it meet our design parameters in milliseconds so they can keep production going? Why aren't we investigating them more? They should be part of RCN, right? Those experiences, those capture managers, the people that thought of doing that, industrial manufacturing should be a huge part of RCN. That's why I wear this or I wore this cap out. And... You know, a lot of my friends in industrial design and manufacturing are like, what's this RCN thing you keep posting about? I'm like, you need to be a part of it because it's bigger than just, no, that's all architects and construction. And I'm like, no, it's not. Not when you get to the brass roots of it. Yeah. Right? You said reality capture. You didn't say the scanning network. Yep. <laughs> you said the reality capture network, right? Yep. So... I think when we think about what is reality and how we're capturing it, the dialogue needs to be broadened and we need to expand on that concept. The other thing that we need to do is stop telling each other no. When we're giving advice or we're mentoring or we're chiming in, stop telling people no. Encourage what those thoughts are. Put the cautions up there and say, okay, be mindful of these things. And just tell them that. Yeah. Just be mindful of these things while you're going on this adventure. Yeah. No, I uh, I think that's a great point. And uh, I, I think that'll be a big takeaway from this conversation uh, for companies to think about. Think about how we, how we foster that idea of not always saying no to ideas and make it an open environment for people to you know approach you and and share and not feel like they're going to get shut down or feel weird you know for bringing up an idea like allow creativity into the workplace allow people to approach you and and or create a process for people to submit ideas or something i think i think would be awesome and and through collaboration as well um like i know you said there's a lot of like questions around ip and who owns what and security and um I think there's still ways to go about 
very, very beneficial collaboration in the industry without uh, crossing boundaries that may be inappropriate for some companies in a, in a security or, or IP level. Um, and we see it happening a lot. And it's part of why we're so excited about what we're building. It's going to be cool. So I, I, how many registrations you have so far? I have no idea. Thankfully, I have someone else dealing with that. <laughs> okay, cool. Like I said, it'd be nice for you to simulate and put up your own little metaverse of the concert hall since you got a Revit model of it and uh, start to populate it with little avatars of everybody that registers. We almost, uh, we almost did that last year. We built out a virtual metaverse space of the last year's event, and we were going to live stream a a virtual environment at the same time as the physical and have a station at the event. You could walk up and interact with people, but uh, you know, it's one of those things. We have a small team. We have a lot on our plate and it's like, sometimes we have ideas that we want to execute and we got to prioritize and, but we have a lot of ideas we want to build into in the future and we'll see where they go. No, nah, it's cool. There, there's options out there. We'll talk offline. I, I, I like messing around and doing that stuff. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I just had a colleague um, message me a little bit about the same kind of thing. Um, you know, going into different metaverses that have already been created for virtual meetings yeah. and virtual chats and, and other things. Um, I don't know. I just think it's that next step, that next level. I know you guys are a small team, but you have a huge industry of uh supporters yep. that you can rely upon yeah yeah you got a lot of followers man i mean you did a great job with what you've done in the time frame you've done it in. appreciate we, it yeah we appreciate that yeah i mean that is the next uh really that's the next push for us our goal with again with the platform we're building and the following we're building is creating a platform for other people to come in and participate and help educate and help share in being a part of the community. You know, RCN is not a my platform for me to just tell everybody what to do. We've started it, we've built it, we're having conversations, but the next goal is continuing to foster it as a as a community that is able to be used by the community and work together to create things that will help the industry as a whole. So we're excited to see a lot of that unfold over the next year or two. Cool. All right, guys. It's been it fun. has been. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael, for joining us again today. All right. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. All right. Thank thanks, you Michael. Too.